Put your hands together and give him praise. And, and you will say, I've seen Jesus. Oh, come on, somebody. You didn't get it. You didn't get it. I've seen who? Talk to me. I've seen who? Because the thing is, whenever you encounter Jesus, you can't stay the same again. Tell somebody, after this service, if you want to stay the same, it's too late. Come on, somebody. Give me high energy praise. Now, before I commence the preaching and the teaching, let me say this. This is not a lecture hall or a lecture room. Number two, I know lecturer. I am not a lecturer. I'm a coach. Are you hearing me? So welcome, welcome to a very high profile VIP spiritual gathering. Now, I don't need you to sit down there and watching me like a coat the like, like a lecturer to lecture you. I'm not here to lecture you. I'm here to inspire you, to illuminate, to empower you. So when you get out of here, you have the upper hand. Somebody say the upper hand, the upper hand. Tell two people, I'm leaving this service today with an upper hand, with an upper hand. You believe it? Then give me high energy praise. Amen. There is nothing like being cute in the sight of God. The 24 elders, they cast their crowns before him. So please, it don't matter who you are, when you come into his presence and you come into the house of God, cast your crowns at his feet because your crowns mean nothing. Say yes. When you look at the different, the different praises, the different praises from Toda to Halal to Shabak to Shamar to Halal and to Barak. Are you hearing me? Every one of them comes with an emotional response. Even if you look at worship, that comes from the Greek word proskonios. Proskonios means to prostrate, to cast yourself down, to kiss, to show affection to God. Amen? So stop all this stiffness you call holiness. It's no holiness. You are pretending. Amen? I need some high energy praise here right now. Hallelujah! Amen? Now, before you are seated, I'd like for you to take a minute and be nice to somebody. Just say, it's always good to see you in church. Welcome back to the house. Come on, somebody. Go out of your way. Be nice to somebody. And stop being religious. And those of you online at home, just be part of the house and be blessed wherever you are. Be more than a conqueror. Now put your hands together, give him praise. Hallelujah. Now, you may be seated in heavenly places. And before we get... Thank you, Lord. Somebody said the devil is a liar. I can't hear you say it now. Say the devil is a liar. And so is his mother-in-law. Come on, put your hands together. Thank God. This morning, I'll 
I've been observing some things over the years and the decades. And I want to talk to you a little bit about altars, and then I want to connect it to patterns. Say patterns. Talk to me, say patterns. Because I realize that a lot of patterns are products of altars. And sometimes you will see a particular pattern in the lives of people and individuals and families and churches and nations. I used to preach in a church many years ago in a particular city in the United States. It had over 10,000 people and every great name you've heard of, from Dr. Maurice Sorello to um, uh, Archbishop Benson Idahosa to uh, Larry Lee and all those names in those days, everybody preached in this church in a particular city in the United States. That was about 30 years ago. And then something happened and the whole church fell apart. Years after, a young man who came on the scene in the United States and became huge and big overnight, bought that property and invited me to preach for him. And when I did, I told him, I said, hey, there is something about this church. There's a history about this church and building and the land that you need to deal with. I said, there's a technicality and a legality that you need to deal with and resolve so that history does not repeat itself. And he was so gifted and anointed and huge that his understanding and mentality was, hey, listen, I'm good, I'm fine. And I left it alone. Years after I was preaching for a friend of mine, Bart Pierce, Rock City Church. And I, as I was preaching, I saw the gentleman sitting at the back, this pastor. So when I was through my preaching, I sent for him and he came into the bishop's lounge and we were talking and I said, what, what are you doing here? He said, we need to talk. And I said, what is happening? And he started opening up. He was broken and I said, come to my hotel. So we met and he told me the situation and I said to him, that was the same thing that happened to the other pastor. So I put him on a 21 days fast and I said, you go before the church and be vulnerable. Take responsibility, don't blame anybody. And ask the church to pray for you. And ask God for mercy. Now, the only reason why I'm telling you this is because it became a pattern. And later on, he had to give up that church and go take up another church of another bishop that something had happened. And when he went to that church, the same thing that happened to that bishop, I knew him. He was a friend of mine. The same thing repeated itself in the life of this guy. And I said, wow, these things are powerful. And one of the problems the body of Christ has, especially with us faith people, is the belief that when you're born again, all things are passed away and behold, all things are becoming you. True. Somebody say true. I'm not feeling you. Somebody say true. But as much as that is true, it's referring and dealing with some particular situation and issue because salvation is in three dimensions. Salvation is in three dimensions. We were saved. We are being saved. We shall be saved. What was saved? Your spirit. What is being saved? Your soul. What shall be saved? Your body. How is your soul being saved? Romans the 12th chapter, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so you can be born again and speak in tongues and your spirit is transformed, your spirit is brand new, but your soul is the same, your mind is the same, and you either transform or you conform. So you can be born again and still act crazy, born again, speaking in tongues, full of the Holy Ghost and be carnal and be soulish and act like an unsaved person, insane and act like you are mad. Yeah. And still do the things you used to do before you got saved and before you got born again, even though your spirit is brand new, 
your soul is the same and your body is the same. If before you got born again, you were overweight, you will still be overweight. If your nose is like my nose, you get born again, your nose ain't going to change. It's still going to be the same. If you were tall before you got born again, you are not going to become short because, because you are born again. And if you are short before you got born again, when you get born again, you are still short. Don't look at me with that religious look. Somebody say, talk to me. I'm talking to you, but I'm not feeling you. Somebody, come on. Can, can you give me some high energy response? Amen. So, so when you don't understand the dynamics, the rules of engagement as it relates to our salvation, you can be born again and still be disadvantaged. Now the Bible said, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. Then the Bible said that I know the thoughts I have of you are the plans. They are of good and not of evil. Jeremiah 29, 11. And the Bible said, I want you to be above only and not beneath. Say above only, above only. I can't hear you. Say above only, above only. Then he said, you'll be the head and not the tail. The head and not the tail. The head and not the tail. Above only. That is God's plan for you and I. He wishes as well. God has not planned any evil. He has not planned any defeat. God has not planned any evil for you and I, but good, say but good. However, every now and then, you see things happening and going on in the lives of believers that shouldn't happen. Now the Bible said my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Now if you look at Psalm 49, and the 20th verse, he said, the man of knowledge who lacks understanding will perish like a beast. Are you hearing me, somebody? Say, I will not perish like a beast. Say, I will not be ignorant of where I sit and stand in the Lord. Now, now you better talk to me because if you don't respond, I'm going to sit down. Are you hearing me, somebody? Say, I will not perish like a beast in the name of Jesus. Say, I will not be ignorant of where I sit and I stand in the Lord. Say yes. So, I want to talk about 20 years ago, I preached a message entitled Patterns of the Bloodline. If you haven't heard it, you can go on YouTube, you get it. Patterns of the Bloodline. There are certain patterns, and some are good, some are evil. And it all has to do with foundations, it has to do with altars, and it also has to do with curses. Curses, there are three kinds of curses. Pronounced curses, written curses, inward curses. Time won't let me go into that. But lift up your right hand, say in the name of Jesus, I proclaim before heaven and hell, in the name of Jesus, that I will not be a victim of any curse, anyone's curse. I will not be a victim of any consequence or error of my bloodline in my Kairos moment. Say in the name of Jesus. Say in the name of Jesus. In the prime of my life, I will not be disadvantaged. I will not be a casualty of any manipulation of the adversary and of any demonic prophecy. In the name of Jesus, if you believe it, put your hands together, say yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Lift up your hands. Kadi Lasunda. Talk to the Lord for one minute. Katahaza. Sonahasia. Amalika tun kudaligaza. Azinda lu kumandi lawahasan. E katunda kafansi maya. E yamaha lakusun. Pelida lukasima lita one. Wahakin dele. Wherever you are at home, at well, in your car, wherever. Pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Zazazun. Zadin. Zeven. They come to Wanda Kasan, Likayanda Baluzu Bidiye, Ikayunda Kasimanda, Wahalakatundi Kasamaha, Ye, Mosamataha, Ikantu Fan, Ikanda Walasiki Mondi Sanda. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, the first time we heard of 
altars or an altar was in Genesis, the eighth chapter, after the flood, Noah raised an altar unto the Lord. And individuals can raise altars, family altars, like our church here, we have a powerful altar here, and an altar for nations and all that. We'll get into the details another time. But I want to connect it to certain patterns. There was a lady in this house many, many, many years ago, uh, she dated three men and she was very, very pretty and very good. And she dated three men and every one of them died just before they attempted to marry. And the thing is, whilst they are dating, everything goes well. As soon as they decide to marry, the guy dies. And there was an issue, there was a reason for that. When we investigated, there was something to do with her birth. There was a technicality. There was a legality that was not resolved. So even though she was born again, it gave Satan a claim. Now, Jesus said in John the 14th chapter and the 38th verse, he said, the prince of this world is coming. The prince of this world cometh, but has nothing in me. Because my blood, my blood is different from the blood of Adam. My blood is not subjected to Adam. My blood came from heaven. The Bible said, the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth. So Jesus said, he can come and try me in any shape or form. He can't get me because there is nothing in my blood he can lay hold on because my blood came from heaven. When the angel came, Gabriel, and met Mary, and Mary said, how can these things be? Knowing that I know not no man. And, and the angel said, don't worry about it. This thing, the seed you will carry will be transported from heaven. So the blood of the lamb was transported from eternity into time, planted in the womb of Mary. And it had nothing to do with Adam's blood. And that's why he was tempted at every point. Every one of us are tempted by, and yet he was without sin because his blood was pure. His blood came from heaven. It wasn't contaminated, so you can't touch it. Are you hearing me, somebody? The Bible said, for all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. When did we sin? How did we sin? When Adam sinned, we sinned. When Jesus rose from the dead, we rose from the dead. When he ascended, we ascended. When he sat on the right hand of the Father, we sat there with him. Somebody say yes. So you got to understand these things, you know, if you don't get it, you become a victim. And there are so many believers, men of God, pastors, bishops, prophets, apostles, archbishops, name it, deacons, elders in the church, that are victims of certain technicalities, victims of the claims and demands of altars in their background that so many of them have no idea of. But these things exist, and whether you have whether you have knowledge of them or not means nothing. It is what it is. It will come after you, and you can be anywhere, and it will hit you. So Genesis eight. Let's begin our journey right now. As I talk to you, C can I talk to you for some few minutes? Uh, I I'm not feeling you. I said, can I talk to you for some few minutes? Now uh, Genesis eight and twenty. Genesis eight and twenty, and. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So you see, what determines the strength and the power of an altar is the sacrifice on the altar. What you place on the altar. If we want this altar in this house to be exalted above all other altars, it's not just how we build the altar, but it's what we put on the altar. It's the sacrifices and the seeds we place on the altar that will determine the strength of the altar. Are you hearing me? Now come with me to Matthew 23 and the 19 verse. And you got to understand this because it is the altar that sanctifies the gifts. If it's a holy altar, if it's a godly altar, it will sanctify the gifts. Now, if it's a demonic altar, it will contaminate the gift. So the altar sanctifies the gift. Go ahead. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift 
or the altar that sanctifies the gift. You see, he said the altar that sanctifies the gift. So it's important for you to understand that whenever you bring your gifts to the altar, the gifts is sanctified by the altar. But it is also the strength and the measure and the magnitude of the gift and sacrifice that determines the strength of the altar. Say yes. And so we want to look at Genesis, the 13th chapter, the third and the fourth verse. We want to look at Abraham. Abraham established four altars in his lifetime. The first altar you can write was known as the altar of praise, the altar of praise. Then the second altar was the altar of peace, the altar of peace. Then the third altar was the altar of prayer, the altar of prayer. We put all the scriptures on the screen for you. Then the fourth altar was the altar of provision. The altar of provision. He has different kinds of altars. But if you look at Genesis, the 13th chapter, the third and the fourth verse, something happened about Abraham's grandson. As a result of the altar he established. Now it is said that in every society there are different types of people. At least about three kinds of people in every society. Number one, and this came from the Greek philosophy, that in every society, there are three kinds of people. The number one are individuals that are very prosperous, intelligent, self-sufficient, but are into themselves and just their family and them. That's it. They don't care about anybody. Nothing matters. No one matters but them and their immediate family. That's it. Such people, history will not treat them fairly. And their names will not be mentioned by history, nor by posterity. There are people that shall be forgotten because they live for self. And all they cared about was self and their immediate family. The second group of people are those that are wealthy, intelligent, giving so much resources, influence, access to do good, to do good for God and man, and yet will not do it, and they live just for their tribe. They believe in their tribe. They will kill you for their tribe, and all they believe in is their political party and their religion, these three things. Tribe, political party, religion. They will kill for their political party, and that is what democracy is doing to Africa today and to many nations. In America is the red and the blue state. But the reason why the eyes are working than ours is because they have strong institution. We have an established strong institution like they have, like Europe has. So for whatever reason, we have two political parties that is literally killing and destroying our culture. And this is the reason. Please understand that before you became a member of a particular political party, you were Ghanaian first. So we are one nation and one people before we become members of any political party. And so do not live your life by just putting your all and your trust in political parties. Today, we live in a country since the Fourth Republic, and it's not just Ghana. I see it everywhere in the African nations where you find two political parties dividing the country because if one party comes into the office, the other party in opposition, their members suffer. They are literally bankrupt, undermined, and destroyed. And so when they also come and this party is out of power, they also want to settle scores. It becomes a vicious cycle. We are destroying one another. So we don't have a sustainable wealth. Our wealth, the, the lifespan of our wealth is between four to eight years and it's over. Because everyone is waiting for an opportunity so that they can come in. And when they come in, they destroy the other party's members because they were destroyed. Something is wrong. We need a national agenda. It's time to start talking. We must talk now before it's too late. We have to start talking. And as a people and a nation, we must have a national agenda that compels every political party of our country to work together at 
so that when any party comes into office, it is not your, man, your manifesto. Don't clap. Don't clap. Your manifesto and your agenda don't matter. What matters is a national agenda. Let's go back to my message. <laughs> now, so Abraham, Genesis 13, 3 and 5, 3 and 4, he built an altar. After building this altar, he passed on. Many years after, his grandson, by the name of Jacob, in Genesis 28, 16, came to Bethel. Listen to what Jacob said when he came to Bethel. Genesis 28, 16. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep. Uh -huh. And he said, surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. So watch this. Abraham raised an altar in the name of the Lord at a place called Bethel. Years after, his grandson came there. And when the grandson came, he slept put his head on a stone and he had a dream in the dream he saw a ladder between heaven and Bethel, and he saw angels descending and ascending ladies and gentlemen that was not a coincidence it just didn't happen it happened because many 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 decades and years before then his grandfather raised an altar in the name of the lord and established a connection between Bethel and heaven that one day his grandson will come there and have an encounter with God and an experience with God. Somebody say experience. experience. I can't hear you say it again. Say experience. experience. Let me tell you something. Things don't just happen whether negative or positive. There are consequences. There are consequences. And as we go ahead, I'll show you the serpent in the Garden of Eden that Adam and Eve failed to deal with in the book of Revelation became a dragon with fire out of the mouth. There are things if parents fail to deal with and to correct it, their children and grandchildren may not be able to handle it. Now hear me. I like this generation and that's why I initiate Next Generation Church. Next Gen. Next gen. Don't miss it tonight. Those of you from the ages of 12. I'm going from 12 because in the Hebrew community, at the age of 12, you must be able to recite the Torah. And by 30, you are ready for life. Jesus, at the age of 12, knew his ministry. At the age of 30, he began his ministry for three years. Daniel, at the age of 30, came into prominence. Joseph became prime minister at the age of 30. David became a king at the age of 30. There is something about 12 and there is something about 30. If we don't prepare the next generation, there is no hope. So watch this. Understand this. It's very important. You got to raise altars. You got to empower this house and this altar. Not for yourself, but for your kids and your grandchildren. That there will come a time in the life of your children and grandchildren when they need Adonai and Almighty God that they can come to the altar and encounter God and have an experience and a divine encounter. Jacob had a divine encounter and an experience at Bethel because his grandfather Abraham had raised an altar. Now this is what you got to be careful of. If that was an evil altar, Jacob would have encountered a demon. He would have had a nightmare. Because the altar was a demonic altar. But in this particular instant, he, had, he saw angels. It was angels. It was heaven. It was a divine encounter. It wasn't a nightmare. It wasn't a demon. Why? The grandfather raise an altar may i submit to you ladies and gentlemen under the sound of my voice have you raised an altar for your children 
and for your grandchildren. Have you empowered this altar for the sake of your children and your grandchildren? Have you done anything by God and for country and for subsequent generations? Have you done anything for the benefit of others or it's all about you and your immediate family? We have to start thinking. Thinking, not just about you and I, but we must think about generations yet unborn. We have to think about generations yet unborn. What we are doing is not sustainable. We are compromising future generations. We are living today comfortably at the expense of the comfort of future generations. We can't do that. We must change the rules. We must be aware of what we are dealing with. Come with me to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. Verse 25 and verse 26. So we've seen a godly altar, right, coming from Noah to Abraham, establishing four altars in the different seasons of his life. And also remember that an altar is a meeting place between deities or divinity and humanity. So it's a place where you can encounter demons and you can encounter God. If it's a good altar, angels, an almighty God will meet you there. And if it's an evil altar, it's a place that you encounter demon spirit. An altar is also a place of exchange. The Bible talks about beauty for ashes. So at the altar, we bring our ashes. He gives us beauty. Then the Bible talks about the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So we come to the altar with heaviness and we leave with a garment of praise. Are you hearing me? We come to the altar with our weaknesses, weak, and we return home with strength. We come to the altar with depression and we go back home free. We come to the altar with silver and he exchanges silver with gold. We come with silver and we live with gold. Somebody lift up your hands and say yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the altar is a place of divine exchange. It can also be the place of demonic exchange. If it's an evil altar. Today, when we finish this service, I'm going to dispatch you under the auspices of the angels of God to go to your father's house, to your mother's house, to your grandfather and to your grandmother's house and to cause the total destruction and annihilation of any evil altar in your background that has become a technicality and a legality and has formed a particular pattern in your life and in the life of your family that is not around you to progress, to go forward. And I will show you how you can self-destruct, self-sabotage, and how you can become a victim of a curse or a negative pattern in the prime of life or at a Kairos moment. Lift up your hand and say, I declare, before heaven and earth, that I will not self-sabotage at my carous moment in life. Say in the name of Jesus, I will not self-destruct at my carous moment. Say in the name of Jesus, I will not be a victim or a casualty of any curse, of any curse, of any consequence, of any technicality, of any legality in my father's house, in my mother's house, in the name of Jesus, declare it. Put your hands there, declare it. I can't hear you. Give me some high energy. Give me high energy. Prayer. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, here was Gideon. Gideon was known as a mighty man of valor. He was chosen, empowered, ordained by Almighty God, given skills and weapons to go to war. And God said, Gideon, you've reduced the army to 300, that's fine, but that is not enough. There is an unresolved issue in your father's house. I know some of you are very 
anointed and gifted. I said this in the first service, that I'm not impressed by gifted people anymore. Gifted people don't impress me. When I was young, there was a time when I was excited and impressed by gifted people and anointed people. I don't anymore. Because gifted and anointed people are very dangerous people. They can destroy you and kill you, implicate you, throw you under the bars without conscience. Because they live their life and think that everything is about gift and anointing. It's not. If your character doesn't match your gift and your anointing, you are trouble. It won't last. It's just a matter of time. And understand that you can be gifted and anointed and still live in disobedience and in sin and still live anyway, anyhow, without a sense of repentance and without conscience and still be gifted. I've seen people very, very gifted. They prophesy and it's ditto, 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 ditto. But their lifestyle doesn't match it. Yeah. And the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. That's why Moses could be in disobedience and yet his gift worked. His gift worked. And water came out of the rock. Even though God said, Moses, speak to the rock. Moses didn't speak to the rock. He swore the rock, not once, twice, and that rock represents Jesus. He crucified Christ twice. He took Jesus to the cross twice. And even though he was in disobedience and in rebellion, the gift wet and water came out of the rock for the people because the gift I have, you have, is not for me or my children. The gift we have is for the benefit of others and not for ourselves. So you can be in disobedience and in sin and the gift will still work. But don't be fooled because that was what happened to Samson. Samson was fooling all over the place, but the gift was working until there came a time and a moment where God said it's enough. It's enough. For 20 years, you've been fooling. It's enough, Samson. It's enough. He shook himself and the strength was gone. The Lord withdrew from him. I pray that you will not push God that you will not continue in doing the wrong thing. You will not continue in transgression, in sin and disobedience until the day God pulls out and takes his hand. May you never get to a place in your work with God where he takes his hands off. May you never get there. May you never get to that place. May you repent before then. May you change before then. Say yes. Say yes. Ah, say yes. So God said, God said, my son, there's a technicality, there's a legality in your father's house. There's an altar. And he didn't say, go destroy your altar. He said, it's your father's altar. You didn't establish it. You didn't build it. Your father did. And even though it's your father's altar, it still has implications. It has consequence. If you don't address it, when you go to the battle, in the mix of the battle, when everything is supposed to work for you, the battle will turn against you. Even though I'm with you. Because I'm a just God. That thing will come after you. So he said, go to your father's house. Destroy the altar. And after you have destroyed the altar, raise another altar in my name. Raise a new altar. I don't know if my father or my mother raised an altar for me. I don't see it. But I understand that I have a duty and I will fulfill it. And a responsibility and I will fulfill to raise an altar, not just for myself, but for my children. And not just for my children, but for my grandchildren like Abraham did. So that many generations here after, when time is gone, Dust is settled, and water finds its level, and the curtains are brought down. And I am done according to all that is written and spoken of me in the volumes of the book. And time ends, and man leaves time into eternity. That those who come here after, and my children, and my great-grandchildren, will know that once upon a time, 
a man of my kind and my caliber walk the face of the earth and my footprints will be there as a man who was not selfish nor greedy who didn't live for himself but live for God and country and the behalf of others if you believe it put your hands together say yes it is said that the third group of people the second group of people are those who live for political parties their whole life and existence is about their political party they'll kill for their party kill for their religion and it's all about their religion their party and their tribe that's it the third group of people is said to be that was that was what got me into that whole move of talking about democracy and everything the second type of people who live just for their party religion and and tribe but the third group of people is said to be this is the greek philosophy that the third group of people who matter in every culture and society and leave a mark for posterity to remember them and for history to treat them fairly are the kind who don't live for self for their political party religion or tribe but they live for god for country god and country god and country that's it that is not about their religion tribe or political party but it's about god and country that everything is about god and country the good of country if we as a people will stop killing one another stop hurting one another stop undermining one another stop discrediting one another and realize that before we join any party we are first citizens of a country we are one nation we are one people We've been here before democracy came. And democracy is supposed to enhance us, not to destroy us. We live in a country and what we are doing is not sustainable. It's just a matter of time and I pray that it will not be too late. I pray for those in authority. I pray for the, our political parties and I pray for all citizens of Ghana that we will not wait till it's too late. Ah, but why is there is peace? And the windows are open that will take advantage of this open window and we will maximize the moment and do something good and something right even if not for ourselves but for the sake of our children and our grandchildren that will create an atmosphere in the country of Ghana that is conducive for creativity productivity and for prosperity of every citizen of Ghana That it doesn't matter what political party we belong to as long as we are citizens taxpayers we're Ghanaians we must be given the free hand no matter who comes into office look at Great Britain they have over two million millionaires and it doesn't matter what party you belong to you are allowed to prosper the same in America you can criticize the president take him to court and still do your business and still prosper you criticize the government you are not an enemy nobody will touch your business as long as you are in compliance with the laws all that our country all that in our time and in our day we will live to see we will live to see history change I pray I pray and I would to God that in my time I will see history change concerning the politics of my country that I will see the private sector prospering and doing well irrespective of the political affiliation of the citizens that they will still prosper no matter who comes and who goes let us not allow the instrument of democracy to divide us and to kill us let's use it for good and not for evil because it can be used for good and it can be used for evil let's look all around us and ask ourselves do we want what is happening in other countries to happen here i was telling them i said when when president rollins my friend came into office after many years and after pndc time they returned to party politics they came back to democracy because they realized that cool 
and reigning and ruling by the military is not sustainable. So they came back to party politics. We don't need to go through that path anymore and to come back after many years again. And now I know that party politics has its own problems. You can, you can look at America and you see the foolishness and the mess going on there. But at least they have systems that hold things together. We must never get to a point where we move away from the rule of law because when we move away from the rule of law, there is chaos, calamity, disaster, anarchy, a state of anarchy. We have to find a way to work the constitution, change some things in the constitution, and to make sure that people in authority don't use the powers given to them by the constitution that doesn't favor the good of the people to misbehave. We must find a way to have a referendum, change some crosses in the constitution that allows the citizens to hold people in authority responsible to make sure they do the right thing by the rule of law and by the constitution. Come on, put your hands together, say yes. Amen. Amen. So watch this. I want, I want us to look at Moses. Come with me to Exodus 2. I want to show you some patterns in the life of Moses. That was very troubling because God testified of Moses. God testified of only three people in the Bible. Moses, Job, and Abraham. And look at something about Moses. Come with me, to, please, to Exodus. The first one is Exodus chapter 2, verse 12. Read Exodus 2, 12. And he looked this way and that way. Uh -huh. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So this is the first His anger. Now this is the man that God testified of and said he was the meekest man on the whole earth. How can Moses be the meekest man on the whole earth and still had a problem with uncontrollable anger? And now I'm speaking and addressing the situation here. For those of you who allow your emotions and your feelings to determine your choices and the decisions you make in life, you are in trouble. If you can't deal with your emotions, if you can't master feelings and pain and emotions, and you make decisions in life based on emotions and the way you feel, you won't last. You will not. Because we were never made to make choices and decisions by the way we feel. People ask me, how are you, Papa? And I said, I'm good. Am I good? No. But I'm not going to say, I'm, I'm not going to express the way I'm feeling because I'm not going to give you ammunition and I'm not going to speak well to give the enemy an ammunition to, to fight me. Proverbs 6, 2. Thou art snared by the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken captive by the words of thy mouth. I'm not going to empower you. I'm not going to speak my feelings. Do I feel good all the time? No. Do I feel to preach this Sunday morning? No. But am I going to Follow my feelings? No. What am I going to do? I will walk by faith. For we walk by faith and not by feelings. And we walk by faith and not by sight. Do I feel appreciated all the time? No. But am I going to act on that? No. Do I feel wanted all the time? No. Do I feel misrepresented sometimes? Yes. If you watch our social media today, it's all about misrepresentation born out of emotions and anger. People are just angry. And when they're angry, they don't care the consequence of their anger. They just go online and they say anything, write anything, insult anybody. Why? There are consequences. The fact that you can just talk don't mean you will go scot free. It's a matter of time. Anybody you attack, anybody you dishonor, anybody you misrepresent, it's a matter of time. Make sure you don't have children and make sure you die prematurely. But as long as you live, it will come back to bite you. It's just a matter of time. But it is written. It is written. It is written. Be not deceived. For God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that he shall reap. He didn't say when, but he said you shall. He said you shall. The only time you don't reap is when you die. But as long as you live and you have children, 
any evil you do to anyone, it shall come back to bite you. It's just a matter of time. So take it easy. Especially those of you who go on social media and you just post things. You just say things. You insult, you insult dignitaries. Yeah. It's in the book of Judah, I'll show you. When, 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 when the archangel Michael was confronted by Satan over the dispute of who must have the body of Moses, the Bible said that the archangel who defeated Satan in heaven will not bring a charge against Satan, but went above Satan and said, the Lord rebuke you. So we have to be careful when it comes to authorities. Sometimes people say, Papa, Papa, there's a lot wrong. There's corruption. You are not saying anything. You have to speak out. Hear me. My pulpit is not given to attack people in authority. That is not my assignment. That is not the Bible. It's foolishness. I did it many years ago during the NDC time, M M M PNDC time. That is zeal. Amateurs do that. The pulpit is to preach the word of God. People don't come to church to hear politics and insults. They come to hear the word of God. We must feed them with the word. And we, are, we must be careful, hear me? The pulpit is not to insult dignitaries. There are people that go online and they will insult everybody. Just because you have the liberty to speak doesn't give you the authorization to insult authorities. You can't just go online and insult our president and former president and just talk and talk and talk because you can talk. There are serious implications. It will come back to bite you. One of these days, when you are in a good place and everything is okay, the things you said about others will come after you. That is the principles of life. There's nothing we do in life, good or bad, without consequence. Everything has consequence, good or bad, if we will become a people and a nation that is driven by an understanding that everything we do has consequence. And we become compliance driven. Oh, what a nation. What a nation. What a wonderful atmosphere. What a great country we have. But as long as we ignore the consequence of our actions and the things we do to one another, we will be self destruct We destroy everybody. We wake up one day and there is no country for our kids and our children. I pray that our children and our grandchildren will not be refugees in another country. And if we don't want our children and our grandchildren to become refugees in our country, in another country, let's protect what we have. Let's guide the peace. Let's guide what we have. Now, I know that Ghana is not perfect. I know Ghana has issues. And I feel what you feel. I go through the same. The other day, my driver came for money to buy gas and I almost I almost lost it I know you don't lose it you are always in the spirit but that day I wasn't in the spirit because I just given them money to buy petrol and after a few days they came for another money for petrol and I said what is wrong with you people you think I'm a fool please and he said Papa you don't know the price of petrol are you and I said what is the price and when they told me I couldn't believe it and I said okay I'm sorry I almost lost it. So I feel what you feel. But the Bible said, the anger of man worketh not the righteousness of God, which stands to reason, logically, that your anger will never solve the problem. So don't resort to anger. There's a better way. Amen. So, let's look at another time when Moses lost it. Let's come to Exodus 32 and 19. Exodus 32 and 19. And it came to pass, as soon as he came now unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the, tab the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. 
This is where the contradiction is. This is what bothers me sometimes when I read the Bible. I struggle, I struggle, I struggle to make sense of some things. And I realize that the Bible is not a textbook and it's not a newspaper. It's a spiritual book and it has earthly sayings with heavenly or spiritual meanings. And it is that understanding that demystifies the mystery of what you are reading to give you appreciation of it. And yet the Bible said, what is the Bible said that, that, that this man, Moses, was the meekest man, find me in my scripture, was the meekest man on all the earth. Yeah, find it for me quickly. Hmm? Numbers 11.3. Numbers 11.3, look at something. Numbers 12, verse 3. 12, 3, quickly. Huh? Now yeah. the man, Moses, was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth no 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 get it this was god testifying of moses this was god speaking that moses was the meekest man than anyone on the earth and at the same time he had an anger problem and look at the extent to which his anger went he was look at it read Go ahead, read it again. And it came to pass as soon as he came now onto the camp yes that he saw the calf and the dancing, yeah. and Moses' anger waxed hot, his and he cast the tables. His anger waxed hot. How can the meekest man, than any man on the earth, be so angry and become uncontrollable that the Ten Commandments that he obtained from Adonai after 40 days and 40 nights, he threw it and destroyed it. And he didn't care about the consequence. The Bible said, make no friendship with an angry man, lest you are ensnared and you become like him. Be careful of angry people. Be careful of people who, when they are angry, they are uncontrollable, whose emotion determines their decision, that they don't care what they do, they don't care what they say. When they are angry, they just go online and they blow it. Listen, you won't go scot free. It's just a matter of time. You throw somebody under the bus. You see, one of the things we don't understand is this. Sometimes, eh, you, father and mother, may be exempted, but God will bring it on your children. That is what a lot of people don't understand in life. Something happened to Noah, and I'll go back to my scriptures. Noah got drunk after he raised an altar. And he raised a vineyard. And Noah became so successful that watch this. He got drunk eh, by the wine from his own vineyard. Sometimes eh, the danger of success is this, that your own success and progress can get into your head and make you mad and insane and cause you to self-destruct. He became so successful that he drank from the wine of his own vineyard and became naked. He lost it and became naked. And one of his sons saw his father's nakedness and he went out to uncover his father. And watch this, those of you who uncover your parents, especially your father and your mother, be careful because your children will uncover you. It's just a matter of time. It's a principle. You see, we are a society that don't care about principles and the consequences of it. But there are consequences for everything we do because we are guided in life by principles. And the Bible is a manual for living and it's full of principles that teaches and guides us how we should live our life. When you buy a television, there is a manual that shows you how to handle it. The Bible is a manual of life that teaches us how we should live what must be done and what must not be done what is acceptable and what is not acceptable if you ignore it there are consequences don't clap watch this and noah was drunk and he laid in his own tent naked in his own tent naked and that word naked means he was vulnerable. He was exposed. God help us. In the day of our vulnerability, within our own walls, and among our own sons and daughters and our children, may God remember 
ask for good and show us mercy in the day that we become vulnerable and naked within our own walls. Mercy. Somebody say, mercy, mercy. Come on, talk to me. Say, mercy, mercy. Mercy. And Noah became naked. And one of his own flesh, one of his own son, Ham, went out to uncover his father. And watch this. The two other sons who were mature said, we don't want to know what Ham knows. We don't want the details. Don't tell me, you know, something happened to a man in this country and some people were sending me videos of it. And I called them and I said, don't send me anything. Don't send me those videos. I don't want to see it. And I said, one day, videos about your nakedness will also be sent around. He wasn't my friend. He's a politician. And something happened that wasn't good. And I said to them, why are you sending me videos? Don't send me videos of somebody's nakedness. What he did was wrong, but don't send it to me. I don't want it. You have time to spread rumors about somebody's nakedness. Go ahead, but don't send it to me. I don't want to say it. I don't want to hear it. And Ham went out and told his brothers. And the brothers said, you know something? Ham, we don't want to see. We don't want to hear. We don't want the details. We don't want any information. This generation is sick. It's a generation that moves by social media. We are always finding out what is new, what's going on, what have you heard, what's happening. We, 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 are, we have become a society of people that just live by social media. Have you seen? It's trending. It's trending. It's going on. It's happening. We are sick. We always want to hear something new. And it's in the Bible. Bishop, go to Acts 19. 17 or 19, the Athenians, the Athenians, who always was looking for something new. What is happening? What's going on? What are they saying? That is what we have become. We live by social media. We don't live by the word of God anymore. We don't live by order and by principle of honoring our father and honoring our mother. We have no respect for elderly anymore. We have no respect for the elderly in this society anymore. You see children fighting parents. Children fighting their father and their mother. One of my kids said to me years ago, when they came back from America, I, I, I needed one of them to meet a friend of mine, and I knocked at the door and opened, and she said, I, I, Papa, respect my privacy. And I said, respect what? Privacy? In my house? When I pay the bill, I feed you, you flush the toilet, the bathroom, and I pay everything? And I said, there ain't no privacy in my house. You want privacy? Go rent your own house and pay your bill. But as long as you live under my roof, I will knock at the door anytime I want to. You can look at me as weird and call me Kolo. Call me any name you want to call me. But that is who I am. Look at it. All the Athenians. Right. For all and the, the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. That's it. That was all they did. The attorneys and the strangers. They spent their time. They weren't studying. They weren't applying themselves. They weren't, they, they weren't deliberate about anything. All they were doing was, what is new? What's going on? It's trending. That's all. This society is sick. That was a serious problem. And our children need help. If we don't groom them now, and teach them values, principles, and consequence of action. There's no future for our children. Somebody say, talk to me. So look at Moses. He destroyed the Ten Commandments. Look at the third one, and let me download this. In talking about Moses, please understand that Moses was a pastor of three million congregation for 40 years. Nobody has ever pastored a church of three million people for 40 years in the past, nor in the future. But Moses had a congregation of three million for 40 years. He walked before them day and night in the wilderness of Sinai. That was how huge and how big he was and how gifted he was. Yet, 
Yet, yet, Moses could not change the pronouncement of Jacob against the anger he had. He had an anger problem. Though he was the meekest man on earth, there was something that every now and then will manifest in him that he could not control and he couldn't handle. We call it bloodline issues. He came up every now and then and he had no power and control over it, even though he was a pastor of three million people. Hear me? This work eh, is not about how successful you are. It's not about your gift. It's not about your anointing. It's not about money. It's understanding the rules of engagement and the rankings in the spirit. But do la me da kasa. Asalan tu kadeis. Say falu tawahan. Ikanda luma hazan. Ilei takuwa hanzan. Falundu kasim. Mevindo vu kasai. Ayala kumunti kavahalasi. I understood something when my father was alive. He wasn't a believer. And yet he was a very powerful man. And I understood the rules of engagement. One day, I was with Bishop Nyako. We were praying in the forest over an issue. And the word of the Lord came expressly. And this was very interesting. We were praying on our own. And of this lady, I knew her. She walked to me and said, young man, that says the Lord, stop the prayers you are offering. Go and apologize to your father because if you don't, something wrong will happen to you. And nobody knew what had happened. Just before I, we went to the prayer meeting, there was an issue I had with my dad. And a friend of his had come and so my dad called me and said, Nick, I don't like what you did. You are out of order. And I said, Dad, I'm tired. I'm tired of your rebuke. I'm tired of you always calling me to order. I'm tired of your parables. And I walked off. You know what my dad said? He said, Nicholas, don't walk off on me. I didn't mind him and I walked off. And I called Bishop Nyako and we went to pray. We went in prayer. And this elderly lady, I know her, she's passed. She walked to us in the garden and he said, young man, that says the Lord, go home and apologize to your father. You are out of order. Stop the prayers, it won't work. And I said, but my father is not born again. My father is not a man of God. He's not a prophet. My father is an ordinary man. Why is he so powerful? So I went with Bishop Yanko and I called another man, Elder Dia, for Church of Pentecost. And we went, and I bowed my knee, and I said, Papa, I'm sorry for disrespecting you before your friend. You know what my father said? He said, now I know that you, God has called you. <laughs> Hear me? And this is what he said. He said, he said it in tea. Anka ene, anka ube hu. So also you are suffering, anka ube hu. So we went back to pray. He forgave me, we went back to pray. When we came back, my father was shivering on his bed. He was almost dying. And I went with Bishop Nyaku and prayed for him. And the Lord said, what is happening to him would have happened to you. And when you came to apologize, he was compelled to forgive you, but he couldn't reverse what he has set in motion against you. Did you hear me? Did you hear me? So the Bible didn't say, honor your father and your mother when they are angels or prophets. He said, honor your father and your mother, period. <laughs> Hear me. As gifted as Moses was, as anointed as he was, Having three million people in his church for 40 years, he did not have the power to override the pronouncement of Jacob. When Moses met God by the burning bush, he had a voice of Adonai and he said, who are you? Tell me who you are. And God said, you want to know who I am? He said, I am the God of your fathers. 
I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And it ended there. He didn't say the God of Moses. He didn't say the God of Moses. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. If you go to Genesis 49, from verse 1, he said, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity. And he said, unstable as water is. Reuben, with all your gifts, with all your intellectual capabilities, and your capacity and ability, and how smart you are, you will, you will end up as nothing. You will amount to nothing. You will be unstable as water because you slept with your father's wife. He said, unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. Thou shalt not excel means that you will never amount to anything. Because you went up to your father's bed. Defile it. And hear me. When Moses was blessing the 12 tribe of Israel, when he came to Reuben, he, he wouldn't touch Reuben. He wouldn't touch him. Because there was a sanction. There was a sanction taken against Reuben by his father's words. And when he came to Reuben, all he could do was to make atonement. And he said, oh Lord, let not Reuben die and let not his men be few. That was all he could say. He could not override what Reuben's father said over Reuben. Because when you compare Moses, even though he was a pastor of three million congregation and had a lot of things to show. Listen, Jacob didn't even have 100 people in his church. His congregation members were 12. That's it. And Moses had three million. And yet, Jacob was of a higher spiritual ranking officer than Moses. And when Jacob cursed the anger of Reuben, it continued to flow in the bloodline and came to Moses' generation. And Moses was a victim of his great-grandfather's anger. And the consequence of that anger prevented him from entering the promised land. Lift up your right hand. Say, I declare that in my Kairos moment and in the prime of my life, I will not be a victim. I will not be a victim of any curse, of any error, of any consequence, of any technicality, of any legality, of my bloodline and of my past. Say, in the name of Jesus, I declare before heaven and hell that in my Kairos moment and in the prime of my life, I will not self-destruct. Let me, let me finish. Let me download and let you go. The way you are looking at me and you are so quiet. Give me Numbers 20 and verse 11. Numbers 20 and 11. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. Speak, he smote. That anger came again. And because of that anger that manifested again, it was an uncontrollable emotion, very destructive emotion that made him very cruel. And God said, Moses, I've had enough of you. I pray that in your lifetime, that you never come to a place where God gets tired of you. For the Bible said, the spirit of man shall not wrestle, the spirit of God shall not wrestle with man forever. He said, I won't do it forever. So let's take the opportunity we have now. Let's turn around. Let's repent. One of the things that deals with anger is humility. Humility. You need to come to a place where you come down. Humble yourself. Admit. Accept that you are wrong. And especially when you are wrong, don't go around justifying your anger and your pain, trying to prove that you are right when you know you are wrong. It will cost you. Don't do it. Come with me to Genesis 49. Genesis 49. I'll give you two scriptures and I'll let you go. Genesis 49, verse 5 to 7. NIV. See.
Simeon and Levi are brothers. The assaults are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their counsel. Jacob began to disassociate himself with Reuben and Simeon and disinherited them because of their anger. And he said, look at the implications of their anger, the consequence of their anger. When they are hurt, they become so emotional and very destructive and it's cruel. And the father said, I will disassociate myself from them. I will scatter them and throw them out. That is why Moses didn't enter the promised land, even though he was a pastor of a mega church of three million people for 40 years. Go ahead. Let me not join their assembly. He said, he said, he said, I will not be part of the assembly. That means they will never have an assembly. Go ahead. For they have killed men in their anger. And for Moses and Simeon, when they are angry, they will stop nowhere until they murder. Because anger leads to murder. Go ahead. And hamstrung oxen as they pleased. Curse be their anger. He didn't say curse be Simeon. He didn't say curse be Levi. He said curse be their anger. What does it mean? It means that anytime the anger manifests, they attract the curse. That means anytime the anger comes, this is what happened. They activate the curse. Years ago, I had a daughter in this church. She used to help with my kids. And she was a very beautiful but intellectually sophisticated, very high intellectual girl. And the brothers used to have problems with her. And one time the brothers came and said, Papa, this is your daughter. Her standard is too high. Tell her to come down small so we can propose to her. And I said, I can't do that. I can't do that. That is who she is. If you want her, you have to raise your standard also. I cannot tell her to change who she is. And they went and told her that Papa says she's very proud and arrogant and high-headed and minded. So she came to me one day crying. After that on Sunday, she said, Papa, Papa, I almost left the church. I said, why? She said, you know, the brothers came to me and said, I'm proud. You said, I'm proud, I'm arrogant. How can you do that to your daughter? You threw me under the bus. And I said, no, 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 no. That wasn't what I said. I said, I'm being, I'm being implicated. They are setting me up in my own house. And I told her exactly what I said. And I said, it's not true. Call them. So I called them. They came around. And I said, what did I say? And she realized that that wasn't what I said. A month after, a friend of mine came to town. And she served my friend in the house. They became friends. And they married. And they are still together now. Having many kids. Now watch this. A month after. A month after. A month after. You know what was happening? The enemy. We are, listen. This enemy, eh? He's better and smarter than your father. Was. Because the Bible calls him the old serpent. Say the old serpent. This, this devil, he's older than you. Yeah. And so let me tell you something. Don't be too carried away that you are smart. I like wise people than smart people. Because smart people are not wise. And wise people may not be smart, but they've been through something, survived something, and makes them wise. Hear me? Listen, when you see people in authority eh, or at the top, you may not like them. But the fact that they are up there, it means they know something others don't know. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. They might miss it in everything, but they have one thing and know something others don't know. But let me move on. She was so hurt. And when she came to, she was crying. And I said, What is it that is troubling you to this extent? <laughs> Hey, this is heavy. And when she downloaded it, I said, uh -uh, I'm being misrepresented. If she didn't give me the opportunity to explain myself to her, she would have left and missed it. One man after, the type, the kind of a man she wanted showed up. And she was in the house, and the very vessel that God was going to use to bless her was the vessel that was implicated. Got to be careful. Have to be very careful and wise. Because this enemy, he's good at what he does. 
he can so set you up, implicate you, that like, like Joseph, you can't explain yourself. No matter what you say, the woman have evidence of it. Your garment. I told the young generation, next time when you are running, take your garment with you. <laughs> Do what? Take your garment. The garment is the evidence. Tell someone, next time when you are running, take the evidence. Take the evidence. Amen? Now, now, watch this. That was a serious pattern. Eh? Anger. So anytime you are angry, and I've watched people, pastors, who are victims, pastor's wife, children of God, prophets, when they are angry, the other day I had a meeting some years ago in my office of two bishops, two bishops. One of them was NBC and one was MPP. And these are my own bishops. Though. And they knew I was CPP. And come and see manifestations of power and anointing in my office. And I was just watching them. And after a while, I said, the two of you are not born again. Yeah, that was the only thing I could say to shut them down. You should see the way they were acting in my office. And I said, why? And they won't, I, I said, no matter what I said, they won't come down. So I said, the two of you, you are not born again. You are Shegelelis. And when I said that, they came down. And I said, what is this? And I said, wow. You mean you can be so passionate about your party that you break all the rules of the word of God and have no respect for each other? I don't get it. Anyway, by the wayside. That was the kind of anger. And you see, because of what they did, they lost my respect. They are still my bishops. But from that day, I took notice of something. That these two guys eh, cannot represent me in some places. They cannot. So anytime there was an opportunity for something, I won't send them. Because I knew that these two guys, eh, if ever a situation comes up and they are provoked, they will misbehave. And I have some people among my pastors and bishops. I use them for different things because I know everybody and I know their temperament and I know their level. A leader must always know the temperament and the levels and the skills of your staff. David committed premeditated murder and adultery. And this was how he killed Uriah. He understood that Uriah had intelligence. He was good at intelligence level. That was where his strength was. But he also understood that Uriah didn't have the skill and the stamina and the capacity to be at the battlefield. So he said, Job, I want Uriah to die so I can have Belsheba, his wife. Put him on the front line, pull the troops back and leave him there. And Uriah was killed. And God was angry with David and said, how did you do that? Why did you do that? I could have given you more if you wanted more women. Why did you have to do that to kill the man and take his wife? I'm against you. Another matter for another day. Let me finish. Let me show you something. Come with me to Psalm 72. Psalm 72. Verse 15. Psalm 72, verse 15. Psalm 72, 15. And he shall live, and to him shall be given of the gold of Sheba, Prayer also shall be made for him continually, and daily shall he be praised. In conclusion, this is a pattern of transgenerational blessing. Say a pattern of transgenerational blessing. This was David before he passed. He prayed. He prayed for Solomon, his son. And the first thing he prayed for, let him live. That means, let not Solomon die prematurely, but let him live. Then number two, Sheba there is Ethiopia. And he said, let the gold of Ethiopia be given unto Solomon, my son. And let prayers also be made for him continuously. And that word praise here, let him be celebrated. I pray that in your lifetime, you'll be celebrated. 
in the name of Jesus. And not just that, but I pray for you that gold will be given unto you and to all your descendants, that your descendants will never lack gold, that you will never lack gold. Say yes. So David prayed that prayer for Solomon and he passed away. Years after, the queen of Sheba, Ethiopia, was relaxing in Ethiopia. And the spirit of God stirred her up and said, it is time for the prayers of Solomon's father to be answered. Take your chariots, your horses, and take the gold of Sheba and travel 3,000 miles to Jerusalem and go and give Solomon gold. And she brought on, at the back of horses and chariots full of gold and delivered it to Solomon in response to David's prayer for his son. Oh, that every father here and every mother here will pray for your children. Pray for your children. Cover your children. Pray for your grandchildren. Cover your grandchildren. Don't curse them. Don't curse them. There is too much pain out there. Everybody is cursing them. Bless them. Don't curse them. Cover them. Shield them. Fight for them. Do laki di mahada. Asanda kawahasia. Seluta kanda. Falu awasan ikandu la masanda. Hey, hey, kimolu bahasan me falu kimatan. Fight for your children. They are bad, cover them. They are messing up, cover them. They are not honorable, cover them. They are not treating you right, cover them. You have no choice. Stand on your feet.